welcome to another episode. Apparently, we're, this is just going to extend our run of uh, the apparent conspiracy uh, connecting comic books to Wisconsin, because almost everyone we have interviewed, <laughs> no matter where they're from or whatever, has some sort of Wisconsin connection. In Bo- it's 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 uh yeah it's a it's an interesting phenomenon that we've. Uh, that we've uh, come across. Obviously, uh, Mike has one, and a lot of people know that. But uh, yeah, even Dennis Dennis has a Wisconsin connection too. I am a card carrying member of the Wisconsin Mafia, Comics hey, Mafia, Comics <laughs> Mafia. There, there you go. Well, Mike, you can introduce him. Well, Dennis is a giant of the comic book scene, and especially of the underground comic book scene. If you weren't around in the late '60s and early '70s you may not be aware of how vital the underground comic book scene, and Dennis was a great part of that with his kitchen sink press. He's from Milwaukee, and uh, I'll never forget the day I met him. I was attending the University of Wisconsin, and there was a knock at my door one day, and I went, it was Dennis, and he said, hey, I I hear you uh, write for newspapers. And he introduced himself, and we started kicking around. uh, And uh, I... uh, I started to pick up Dennis's uh, newspaper. What was that paper you published in Milwaukee? The Bugle American. That's right, the Bugle American. And it features Dennis's art, uh, which is unique, by the way. And there's a book out about it from Dark Horse called The Art of Dennis Kitchen. And it's called The Weird Art, or is it The Bizarre um, the, Art? The Oddly Compelling Art. <laughs> the Oddly Compelling Art. And it's true because uh, uh, Dennis has a style that's all his own. It's inimitable, inimitable. Uh, Nobody's tried to copy. Nobody dares try to copy it. And uh, Dennis was also at the time publishing vital underground cartoonists such as R. Crumb. Uh, And uh, who are some of the other underground cartoonists who you gave early exposure to? Well, early exposure, I mean, Howard Cruz, certainly. uh, I mean, you can go down the list, I guess. Uh, Aileen Kaminsky, Trina Robbins, Jay Lynch, Skip Williamson, Corbin. I don't know. Yeah. I don't have the list in front of me, Mike. Yeah, I wish I did. You know, I could. I have that book. And I got that guide to underground comics that Fantagraphics mm. put out. I should run and get it. Uh, but it wasn't until uh, I moved to Boston and began working for newspapers uh, that I started to work regularly with Dennis. And I first, I think my first published article for you was how to modify a park water gun. And it, uh, it taught you how to increase the magazine capacity of the water pistol. I don't know how we got away with it in those days. That was in the, um, the Marvel experiment comics book number one. Right. Uh, and, and in fact, in fact, it was your article that drove Art Spiegelman out of the magazine. <laughs> Did he object to the increased magazine yes, capacity? He said, what's that doing in a magazine about underground comics? And I yeah. said, I don't know. I thought it was cool. And he said, I didn't. And that was it. <laughs> and, and it's funny because uh, I love Art Spiegelman. I love his work. And I met him years later. He had no idea who I was. I was just saying, hi, I, I greatly admire your work. Uh, but then I uh, began writing stories uh, for Kitchen Sink uh, that appeared in Weird Tales. In fact, I, I have a copy of that Weird Tales nearby. Weird, I wonder. Weird, uh, weird Trips. Weird Trips. Weird Trips. I wonder if I dare show that cover. Mm, probably not. All right. Yeah. All right. It was highly controversial. Uh, and uh, then I started uh, writing stories. And you hooked me up with that unique Canadian artist who uh, ran with what Wally Wood created. and Rand took Holmes. It, yeah, Rand Holmes. And took it to the nth degree. And I treasure those stories. It was a great opportunity to work with an artist like that. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Rand Holmes was a guy, his art deserved a much wider appreciation, but he was, he had trouble. Uh, and he could only produce so much, and he's no longer with us. Right. 
Uh, but the works have all been reprinted. There is a big fanographics book out called The, uh, the Life of Ran Holmes, which contains his biography and many of those stories. Uh, Dennis had a, an enclave in the middle of Wisconsin. He bought a farm. He had a big barn and a farmhouse. And uh, you built apartments for your artists in the barn so that they could live in the country and work on your books. Some say they were under the control of armed guards and had to produce so many pages a day or there would be repercussions. But I never saw the armed guards. Yeah, the locals called it a commune, but it was actually a hippie condominium. And you had some wild parties there. We did. I remember returning to Madison in 1977 uh, and uh, driving up there in my Volkswagen for those parties. And I, I think we, we slept on a sofa in the living room, but everybody had a great time. Uh, but at some point, uh, you made that deal with Marvel. Uh, did they come to you? Yes. Uh, oddly enough, uh, Stanley and I became uh, pen pals starting in 1969 when I sent him my first comic Mom's number one. Oh, I and, uh, that. He, he liked the fact that my letterheads kept changing and he just enjoyed the samples. I think he was befuddled to a large degree, but, but he was always friendly and he started calling me and uh, he asked me if I wanted to come and work in the bullpen, which at a certain point in my life, you know, would have been like amazing because I was a Marvel fan for a long time. But when he called me, I was having fun with my own, you know, my own business and I could do whatever I wanted, where I wanted. And so I turned him down, which I think shocked him, but he was persistent. And finally, in 1973, Undergrounds went through a, a, a depression. We call it the crash of 73. And at that point, he called at a propitious time when I was uh, worried about paying rent the next month. And so I said, all right, Stan, let's talk. And he flew me to New York. And I told him I still didn't want to work in the bullpen and live in New York. But um, if he let me stay in Wisconsin, I could put together a bi-monthly magazine for him. And that led to comics book. How many issues did you uh, produce? Five altogether, although... Marvel published three, at which point he pulled the plug. And um, it was mainly for political reasons, as far as I could tell, because he gave my guys stuff Marvel never gave anyone else, like returning artwork, allowing the creators to keep their copyrights and trademarks, allowing us to use four letter words, mild nudity. And so the rest of the guys who were in the bullpen and seeing Stan regularly finally said, hey, why are you giving those long-haired guys, um, you know, these perks that we don't get? And Stan didn't really have a, an easy answer. To, to be fair, he had just taken over the publisher role after Martin Goodman retired. And so he was kind of green as a publisher. And uh, he thought he was making a smart move and it backfired politically. So the easiest thing was to kill the magazine. Um, I never saw any final sales figures, so it's possible the numbers were not good too, but um, I think it was more political. Have those books ever been collected? Yes. A few years ago, Dark Horse did the best of comics book. Comics with an X for readers who are looking it up. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't Crom a guest of yours in Wisconsin at one time? Oh, yeah, more than once. He almost moved uh, to uh, the Princeton area. My friend's uh, mother had a place for sale that Robert and Aileen fell in love with. And then uh, when they called the woman, my, f my friend talked her out of it, said he wanted it. And so, so that prevented uh, the crumbs from moving to Wisconsin. Are but you still in there? He liked it there. Are you still in communication with Crumb? Yep. Yep. Are yep. you publishing? He's, well, he doesn't produce a lot these days, really. 
Uh, the last comic he did with his wife and daughter was, uh, I forget, French title, but it was about them arguing about COVID. Uh, Robert's an anti-vaxxer, unfortunately, but Aileen took the pro-vax stance and the daughter was kind of in between. But, you know, he does stuff in his sketchbook, but I think the days are over when he's cranking out new full-length comic books. He's almost 80, you know. Yes. Uh, and it's when you look back at his body of work, it's remarkable how much he did produce. I mean, that guy was, was not parsimonious with the pen. No. Well, he was compulsive, you know. So it's partly, I think, a medical condition where he just had to draw everywhere he went. The notebook went with him. And I don't know that, you know... I don't, I don't want to diagnose him here, um, but there was a compulsive quality to it that some artists have and some don't. Uh, I think one of the qualities I admire most about him was his absolute fearlessness about exposing his innermost feelings about anything. Uh, I don't think the word censorship is in his vocabulary. And uh, because of that, a lot of his material is highly offensive to special interest groups. And uh, he was denied entry to Australia for being a, a sex cartoonist, which does him mm. a great disservice. Right. No, it's true. Uh, he inflames uh, a lot of people, understandably. But uh, nothing's going to stop him. What's this book you plan to publish this fall? Um, I do, um, my own compulsive drawings, uh, are done on a chipboard. Do you know what chipboard is? It's like the back of a tablet, uh, that heavy, heavily grained, uh, thick. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I love drawing on that surface with, uh, a, a Sharpie marker and a ballpoint pen, you know, basically, uh, yeah. and, um, most evenings I will just pick one up and just start without any preconception. The part of the, the fun for me is not knowing what I'm going to do. And I just let the hand move and it's kind of a, a subconscious uh, thing. And what comes out of it are some very strange creatures or faces or subterranean scenes or whatever. And I just collected the best, I think, 170 from the last few years. Um, a small press in Denver called Tinto is publishing. It's called Creatures from the Subconscious. You produced enough material uh, for the Milwaukee Bugle, in which you had a regular strip, uh, to fill several books, didn't you? Well, I wouldn't go that far, Mike, but... Uh, <laughs> I was more prolific then, you know, I, I certainly started as a cartoonist and that's still the most fun thing to do. But early on, I became a publisher by default and publishing became full time for the next 30 years. So cartooning was relegated to part time for better or worse. And, um, you know, same now, as you said at the beginning, I, I, I wear probably too many hats to focus uh, uh, on any, but it's interesting. Dennis also wrote uh, a biography of El Cap, which I think is outstanding and probably the definitive biography of El Cap. Well, it's the only one so far. Um, <laughs> and and actually, I co-wrote it with Michael Schumacher. We've got to give him credit. Another cheesehead, yeah. by the way. Oh, wow. Good to know. Why El Cap? Why El Cap? Because I, growing up, I was addicted to all comics, both comic books and newspaper strips. But the one that every day captured my imagination the most was Little Abner, because Cap was a master of cliffhangers, he drew beautiful women and really weird characters. They were either hideous or gorgeous. And uh, he was funny in those days. Um, and as I got older and Cap's career started taking strange political turns, I 
followed his career with a certain fascination and horror. And so um, ultimately, I just decided I, I had to write about him because uh, I couldn't stop thinking about all the strange inconsistencies and the great talent and yet the dark side of him. He ended up really becoming what today we'd call a sexual predator. But at the time, nobody knew. And if anybody had a hint, they would say, oh, he's a bit of a womanizer. But it was a lot worse than, than calling it womanizing. But at the same time, he was a genius cartoonist who had a big impact on the American culture. So, so there's a lot there. For me, the high point was him descending on John and Yoko's <laughs> hotel room. Yeah, that wasn't his high point. On the other hand, to be fair, John Lennon was provoking him too. The whole thing was a publicity stunt intended to help them both. But uh, if, if, if any of your listeners haven't seen it, they can find it easily on YouTube. But to me, the worst was when uh, Cap looked at Yoko and she said to John Lennon, how can you sleep with this thing he couldn't even call her a person or a woman. He called her a thing. And, uh, yeah, it didn't get any better. You know, I always thought that uh, that material would make a fascinating stage play or a movie. Hmm. I'm surprised nobody has done it. I, you know, there have been several movies about when Elvis met Nixon. Right, right. When uh, Elvis wanted to be a, a cop. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he collected he collected uh, police badges. Wasn't he like made an official DEA agent when he met Nixon? I've seen it's a possible. I do know that he would patrol the highways around uh, his home uh, in Tennessee on a motorcycle and stop people who were speeding wow. and give them a little lecture. <laughs> Facts wow. stranger than fiction, right? <laughs> This is Elvis uh, lives on in the imagination and in popular culture. Uh, there have been so many movies about him. I'm looking forward to seeing this new one that was directed by Baz Luhrmann. Yeah. Have you well, seen it? No, I haven't, but I know he does beautiful films, so it'll be at least visually interesting. Are you publishing anything these days other than this upcoming book? Um, I'm still a part-time publisher. The most recent thing was I just did two um, box card sets by Bill Stout called The Legends of the Blues and More Legends of the Blues. They're based loosely on what Crumb did with blues, jazz, and I remember. But, uh, but Bill has his own take, and it's a more modern uh, group of musicians. And the portraits are just stunning and lovely. And, I will get that. Uh, um, you can find them on Amazon or eBay yep. or the DennisKitchen.com. If you mention the Baron Earl show, you get 20% off. <laughs> hey, do it. Den Dennis, you are a blues fan, aren't you? Absolutely. Uh, do you still go see live music? Not as often, no. But you got to remember, I live deep in the western yeah. Massachusetts woods, not near civilization. I remember uh, meeting Muddy Waters mm. at uh, a, a tavern in Madison. And I asked him to sign my copy of Fathers and Sons. Oh, wow. And he gripped the felt tip pen with like an ice pick oh. and, and wrote his name out very carefully in block letters. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Otis Spann visited at another time and I got him to sign that album as well. I wish I still had it. Well, yeah, it's great. I, I When I lived in Milwaukee, a lot of the uh, Chicago blues men would come up to uh, a place called the avant-garde on the east side. It was a very small, cramped place, but I would get there early, get a front row, and I'd be literally three feet from Walter Shaky Horton and guys like Muddy Waters and you name it. It was a great time. That would have been around 69, 70, 
maybe 71? Uh, we were lucky to uh, be in Wisconsin at that time because most of those great, well, not all of them, but, but a lot of great bluesmen were, were centered in Chicago. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they would gig around the area and they always found universities uh, a welcoming venue. So we were lucky to see those guys uh, like Magic Slim was another guy I saw. Uh, sure. B.B. King several times, although I'm not sure B.B. was located in, in uh, Chicago. Uh, today, there doesn't seem to be any equivalent to the underground scene. I mean, there are thousands of independent comics, uh, but most of them seek to emulate superhero comics. Uh, there are a great deal of, of, of personal books being put out. Right. And, and some of the great underground cartoonists uh, have migrated over into uh, graphic novels, which are getting published and distributed. Right. Uh, and uh, you can see a lot of them in, in, their, uh, in Barnes & Noble, but uh, you, don't, you don't see underground comic stores anymore. You don't see that underground distribution or that underground sensibility, at least not in those little pamphlets we used to get for two, three, four, and five dollars. Now you got to shell out 30 bucks. Such is life, Mike. Yeah. Many of them are autobiographical. Yes. And the first one was Justin Green, who kicked off that whole genre with Binky Brown meets the Holy Virgin Mary. I remember that. I had Just, that. Yeah. Fact. Justin passed away just a short time ago. And he was a real giant in the field. But so unappreciated that for the last two or three decades of his life, he had to paint signs to make a living. Just like Rand Holmes, who you mentioned earlier, when I would try to get him to do stories like the kind you and he did in Death Rattle, he would always say, I can make more money doing carpentry. So I would have to double my price and basically, you know, cut out the profit margin to get him to do a story. And I thought such a sad state of comics that, such really geniuses can't make a living doing comics. Now, that's not to say some couldn't. I mean, in the underground days, it was a royalty system. So if you were, say, a Crum or Gilbert Shelton, you were on Easy Street just from undergrounds. But, uh, but for the average underground cartoonist, you know, you might only get $25, $50 a page, maybe $75, depending on how many times it was reprinted. And depending on how fast you drew, not an easy way to pay the rent, especially if you had a family. I understand Gilbert Shelton lives in France as well. He's lived in uh, France for, God, it's got to be 40 years now. And, uh, yeah, he, he and his wife love it there. He, still, seen... he, speaks, he speaks French with an Austin accent. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. I was I was at a party once with uh, with Gilbert and mostly French people who were speaking English for the benefit of people like me. But Gilbert was speaking French, and at one point, one of the Frenchmen turned to Gilbert and he said, "He said, Gilbert, we appreciate that you learned our language, but please speak English." <laughs> so if you can imagine uh, a Texas twang. Uh, does go well with French. You know, I, I can't think of a more unlikely cartoon strip to be turned into a TV show than the fabulous furry Freak Brothers. And yet there it is. Yeah. Yeah, there's some very, some very talented people working on it. To me, it's, it's full short. It, it just, it's too clean looking. It doesn't look gritty. It doesn't have that no, doesn't. In detail, you know. And it's not nearly as clever as Gilbert's no. own writing. No, I, I don't know why they don't just take some of his scripts intact. That I don't either. Would hold up, but hey, we're not in the TV biz, right? Yeah. So does Mr. Earls get to speak in this? Uh, yeah. Show? I, well, I was kind of letting him him, <laughs> him go a little bit because I know he was he was pretty eager. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm I'm. Is uh, was most of your uh, like the other hats that you've worn? Was that mostly kind of out of necessity or compulsion or or, or whatever? Um, I'm guessing. Well, you know, actually, 
there's a thought. Maybe I was a compulsive entrepreneur, <laughs> but largely it came from necessity. Yeah. Uh, when I, I self-published my first comic at a time when there was no distribution, whatever. This was way before the internet. It's way before you had comic shops. So yeah. I basically schlepped my comics to head shops and used bookstores and the local drugstore and anybody who would take a pile on consignment. I did that for the summer of 1969. And just on the east side of Milwaukee, I was able to sell 3,000 of my comic, which is wow. still pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, so it shows that I knew how to hustle. And uh, basically, that's what a publisher has to do, especially small press publishers. Yeah. So the print mint agreed to reprint Mom's Number One and to publish Mom's Number Two. So I was thrilled that I had a, a publisher finally. Unfortunately, I didn't get what I would call reliable accountings and maybe not even an honest accounting. And so after a dispute with print mint, I decided I'll just self-publish again, which was, you know, not necessarily the wisest decision. But Jay Lynch and Skip Williamson were in Chicago doing Bijou, which was published by print mint. And they had the same accounting issues and the same frustration. So when I told Jay... I was going to self-publish again. He said, well, will you do Bijou too? And I foolishly said, sure, not knowing what I was going to get myself into. But the last thing I wanted to do was disappoint them the way Print Mint disappointed me. So I was very conscientious. And the next thing I knew, I was a publisher. And shortly after that, Crum passed through Chicago, visited me in Milwaukee, and said he would give me his next comic, which turned out to be Homegrown Funnies, which ended up selling, I think, 140,000 copies. Wow. So it all just happened kind of naturally in a way that you could never plan. Um, and then once I was publishing, then the next question was, how do you get them into shops? So I had to start a distribution company. And right. uh, at the same time, I had co-founded the Bugle America that Mike mentioned. And uh, we are on an exchange list with other underground newspapers. So when those exchange papers came in, I would always go in the back and look for the small ads for, for head shops or used bookstores and created a mailing list and started sending our catalog. And that's how the distribution began. And it ended up being nationwide and into Canada and some little parts of Europe. So each happened kind of of necessity, but also as a challenge. We also started a head shop on the east side of Milwaukee. So we were also retailing and we didn't just retail undergrounds. We carried all of the newsstand comics. So if you wanted a Marvel or a DC or a Freak Brothers or a Zap, right. it was strictly up a crust. That was the one-stop shop for comics in Milwaukee. And, uh, you know, the rest of my career, I guess, the same thing. I just saw something that uh, I thought I could do better or I felt, I don't know, could do more efficiently. Yeah, needed to happen. And it was easier then. Life was simpler, you know. I, I You couldn't probably do today what i did then and you've got things in place now you've got diamonds so unless you want to create right. diamond you're not going to start a new distribution company and you've got the internet which is an amazing thing to get your product out and it's 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 a it's a different world largely for better i think yeah so did you know the boys behind capital city distribution milton Greep, and john davis I knew them before Capital City, yes. Um, they were, uh, Milton at least was involved, I think, in WIND, which was Wisconsin Independent News That's right. Distribution. That's right. And uh, he was just an employee there. But when it went bankrupt, he uh, and uh, musician John Davis decided uh, to start their own entity. So I was there on the ground floor with them, and they built an amazing business. Um, and had it not been for 
comics politics, mainly Marvel deciding uh, it didn't need uh, direct distribution. Um, you know, who knows? Again, it's one of those, we yeah. won't get into those weeds, but capital should have lasted longer and it should have been what Diamond is now. Uh, you know that Milton Rudd's a website called icv2.com, which yep. stands for Internal Correspondence Volume 2. Uh, and that's the web address, icv2.com. And, and for those who are interested on the health of the geek uh, industry, which includes comic books, movies, and games, uh, that site is updated daily and is probably your best source for accurate news. Yep. Did you work with Bill Griffith? Uh, to a relatively small degree to compared with others, yes. Um, <laughs> what, you want me to expand on that? I, I, <laughs> uh, you know, Probably if it not. was that small, it's just... Uh, um, no, I like Bill, and I, I admire what he does. He's a great talent, and you mentioned some of the guys now who are doing graphic novels. He's done several, including one about his mother and who had an affair with a cartoonist of all people. Invisible uh, Link. Yep. And he did one on uh, the real Zippy the Pinhead. He did one uh, on uh, Ernie Bushmiller that's not out yet. Oh. And uh, and he does a daily strip for King Features. So he's uh, one of those really prolific guys. I don't know how he does it. Um, I, and I published some of his work, but uh, um, he and I for a while had some personality differences and uh it took a while for us to get to really know and like each other uh in fact at one point i sent him a letter he didn't like and he sent it back to me all crumpled up and justin green was in wisconsin that summer visiting when uh, the crumpled up letter came and i said justin what am i supposed to do with this and he said wipe your ass with it and mail it back. <laughs> so it was that kind of a testy relationship that took a while to, to moderate, but he's an amazing cartoonist. Oh, you're muted, Mike. Oh, Mike. Uh -oh. Well, it's muted. just, it's you're just you and me now. You're censoring right. yourself, Mike. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Ann is going in out of the garage. If, if I, yeah, Turn off the mic again because the garage door is going down. But I said Ernie Bushmiller uh, was is in many ways an inscrutable cartoonist in that his uh, uh, the strips he drew featuring Nancy and Sluggo, uh, oftentimes you had to interpret them personally, whatever it meant, because it wasn't clear what he was doing. Well, usually they were just bad puns, but some people <laughs> think it's a Zen exercise. And you can contemplate these and reach a state of ecstasy. But that's a whole other tangent we don't have to go down. Uh, unless you want to be a member of the Bushmiller Society. There is such a society? Well, it's rumored, yes. Uh, I, I tell you more, but paragraph kill you. prohibits me from doing so publicly. Dennis. Uh, I, how how did you how did you get started um, drawing and making comics? I mean, were you doing it like in high school or middle school? Started out in grade school, actually. I yeah. I think um, in second grade I would write and illustrate primitive stories, and um, one day I must have made a classmate or two laugh in the back row, and the teacher said. <laughs> what's so funny back there? And I said, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Miss Mayhew. I was just showing someone my story. And she said, well, why don't you come up front and show it to everyone? Right. And so suddenly there was a spotlight on me. And I think it's, I've heard comedians say the same thing happened when they told a joke in class and the teacher made them tell it to everyone. And they felt like, wow, there was some validation. So right. beginning then, yeah, I just thought, well, this is a fun thing, and it makes people laugh or smile or react. And by the time I was uh, 12 or 13, I was doing a, a regular little, uh, 
I don't know what to call it, like a three-page uh, illustrated newsletter, maybe, that had uh, gossip uh, and stories about teachers and classmates. And uh, I passed it around, and one day it didn't come back, and so someone had stolen it. So, so I, uh, a, a teacher, uh, not a teacher, the principal's assistant uh, heard about it, and she said, you know, you can come in after class and use our hectograph machine, which is kind of a mimeograph. And at that point, I started running off multiple copies, and I called it kleptomaniac because of the person who stole the yeah. you earlier. And so klepto continued through uh, – eighth grade into junior high and into high school, I think 25 issues or so. And I would sell them for a nickel a piece back when you could buy a candy bar with a nickel. Right. And uh, that was probably my first revenue generator. And at the time, I, you know, never had a clue what I was going to end up doing, but it was a perfect preparation for being a publisher because I was figuring out how to print them. Yeah. I was hand distributing them, collecting the money and yeah. assembling it editorial and illustrating it. So all the pieces were yeah. slowly coming together in an unpredictable way. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I just, I, cause I feel like a, a lot of comic book people got started when they were, when they were in school making their own comics and things. I actually started in the second grade too. Oh, um, there you go. Stuff. So I was like, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> You're going to show the class. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I couldn't, well, the funny thing was, is like, even back then, uh, obviously could not draw very well. Um, and, uh, but I drew like, I drew like a, uh, a really small house and a really big tree and the t and the, and the teacher was like well, why 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 what does this like mean why is this tiny house i'm like it's not tiny it's further away and so like i couldn't draw it <laughs> properly but but yeah it was uh yeah just things like that i mean just so many um you know whatever writers and artists who whoever like they, they tend to yeah. get that start and and uh, and do and doing um, that stuff. Um, jumping ahead, was you starting uh, the comic book defense fund? Was that out of? I, I don't remember. Um, I'm sure I heard it about the or origination for that. Um, but how did that get started? Well, short version is, uh, I think in the fall of 1986, there was a shop in Lansing, Illinois a suburb of uh, Chicago on the Indiana side got busted. And it was part of a small chain called Friendly Franks. And Frank was one of our distributors who I knew well. And he called me because Omaha the Cat Dancer, one of the comics I published, was busted. Right. And I was upset to hear that. But he said, don't worry. I hired a lawyer. It'll be taken care of. Well, the lawyer he handled, uh, who had handled it, didn't know anything really about First Amendment law, and uh, and she lost the case. And this poor manager, not Frank himself, but the manager of the store was facing a hefty fine and some jail time. Right. So at that point, I said, uh, this is outrageous. We have to appeal it. I said, let me raise some money. And so I put together a portfolio that had art by... Sergio Aragones and Robert Crumb and Rich Corbin and Howard Cruz, myself, I think 10 or 12 artists. And I got our printer to print it at cost. I got the distributors to distribute it without a markup. And bottom line, we sold out. We raised enough money that I could hire the best First Amendment attorney in the Midwest, who was, in fact, I think the guy who represented uh, Hugh Hefner for Playboy cases. So he uh, peeled the case. He won in a technicality and we overturned it. And at that point, we still had thousands of dollars left in the bank. And I, I remember thinking to myself at that point, OK, now what? We could just donate the money to another charity. But maybe there would be other cases involving comics. I hadn't heard of any, but I thought 
just in case. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep the fund. We'll call it the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. And wouldn't you know it, once this case got publicity, we pretty regularly started getting calls because what we found out was local busts were taken care of locally. And usually it was the retailer going, I give up. I will stop carrying what you don't like because they didn't want trouble with the police or local prosecutor. But once there was an umbrella organization that would protect the shop, suddenly they were, in most cases, happy or willing to fight the man. And so we soon decided it would be a permanent organization, and we filed for a 501c3 nonprofit status and got it. And it's been going strong ever since. Started out in Wisconsin, of course, where all things comics start. <laughs> Apparently. Um, but um, then it was in New York City for a while. Now it's in Portland. And uh, there's a staff of four people full time running it. And it has an educational arm, too, which is partly just advising retailers on the smart way to display comics that could be controversial. A lot of it's just common sense, but not every retailer necessarily anticipates some right hostile cop or you know maybe there's a district attorney running for office in a location where it's advantageous to look like you're 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 tough on such things right <clears throat> but even the case in chicago was more complicated than just censorship um the manager michael korea was uh was half african-american dark-skinned and there was some indication that the cops who were white were racist um one of the cops was also a religious fanatic and i only know this because the local paper who reported the bust quoted the cop as saying that the store contains satanic material he said even the posters on the wall were satanic including wonder woman so if your brain tells you Wonder Woman is satanic, <laughs> you probably yeah shouldn't be on a police force. <laughs> that's yeah, that that's fair to say. No, I, I and I when I had first heard about, um, I think I like a lot of people because we hear about um, big name artists or writers who have been involved with like the comic defense legal fund. Um, but yeah, I was, I was, I was really, and I was like, oh, this is really cool that it's for, you know, it's for shops too, and it's, you know, it's for retailers and industry and, and just kind of like anything that affects the comic market or whatever. And, uh, yeah, cause I think, cause I think some people automatically assume, oh, well, they, they represent the artists and writers who are fighting against the publishers who won't do the right, right thing by them. And it's, well. It, it has to be a First Amendment case. So generally right. it's a retailer, but we have right. had instances representing individual artists. Yeah. Um, because it's, uh, it's, a, it's based on a constitutional First Amendment argument, we have to be careful what cases we take. Right. If, if, for example, you say, hey, my publisher ripped me off. Well, all we can tell you is get a lawyer yeah. And sue your publisher. That's not a First Amendment case. Um, right. And so occasionally people are offended when they think we should be representing. Right. Them. When I say we, I, I mean the organization. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm on the uh, I, I ran it for 18 years, but then I I resigned because I just thought it needed fresh blood. But but I'm on the advisory board and still plugged into it. And still proud you know of what it does yeah um and where and is the defense fund located today does it have a central location portland. yes in portland i was listening mike <laughs> <laughs> i was listening to some weird sound on my my headphones <laughs> i've closed out all the other windows so hopefully that'll take care of it yeah yeah did anybody That's, just hear that phone ring? Yes, that was Dennis. He's popular. Leave him alone. <laughs> um, I apologize. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Did, uh, did you have any specific influences aside from Al Cap, obviously? 
Um, you mean on my drawing I, style? I just drawing um, style and color um, style, yeah. Well, Bushmiller. I, I would say there's a Bushmiller. There's a, a simplicity of line that I respect with him. Right. Um, Basil Wolverton for the probably the grotesque qualities and the spaghetti-like hair. Yeah. Um, but it's not like I was ever mimicking anyone, you know. I think right. those were some more subconscious influences. Um, my yeah. feeling just, I think, instinctively was I don't want to look like anyone else. The whole point of cartooning is you like when you can recognize a style. And so if I pick up a comic and I go, that guy's imitating Neil Adams, I'm probably not going to remember that guy because right. that guy isn't distinctive, you know. Yeah. Did you did you illustrate any of the uh, any of the stories that you any of the um, documentaries or like whatever uh, biographies or whatever? Did you ever illustrate any of those? Well, yes and no. Um, the biography of Al Cap, no, that's a straight biography. Right. I also did one on uh, uh, Harvey Kurtzman and one on Harrison Cady, who's kind of obscure, but I love. Um, the closest was I did a short six-page um, mini biography of Dr. Seuss. And uh, that one was right. a mini graphic novel. So, yes. Yeah. And uh, Monty Beauchamp, who edits Blab, the periodic anthology, he asked me to do a similar one on Al Cap. So I may uh, end up doing something like that. But as, uh, as Mike, I think, knows, I'm a relatively slow cartoonist, so I have to be careful if I take on an assignment that's too long. Right. Um, but if it's a subject that's exciting, you know, it'll eventually get done. And the Seuss was interesting because he's not as predictably uh, sweet as his stories. And uh, right. likewise, Cap, we already know, was uh, in many ways a very dark guy. So it'll be an interesting story to condense. <clears throat> if Seuss were alive, he might approach the comic book defense fund. <laughs> uh, well, n no, not for the. Well, I mean, you're right. He is getting censored now. You're right um, for alleged uh, racist elements. I think, but uh, I don't know. I I think uh, I would argue with the people who are jumping on Seuss because of that. Uh, um, but that's a whole other argument. You know, I miss the incredible variety of art styles and uh, the personal stories uh, that mark the underground comics movement. And I wonder, uh, and there are exceptions. There are people who are doing that today, uh, but most of them aren't American anymore. And I, and I, I wonder if the uh, success of comic books, and not that anybody's, well, some people are getting rich about comic books, but the world of comic books has, has so exploded uh, with so many different publishers publishing such a wide variety of material uh, that young cartoonists these days don't even think of doing personal stuff. They just want to get published with a big company and get distributed. Well, I would argue there's two worlds. There's the one you just described, but if you go to the conventions like SPX or um, uh, the one in, uh, in New York, the, um, oh God, they're all over you know, TCAF in Toronto, you see the more independent creators, the small press, the self-published people. Yeah. And there is an amazing amount of stuff going on there, which you may not see because you might be more plugged into the mainstream comics. Is there some clearinghouse where we could take a look at those books? Oh boy. It's tough because there's so many of them. I know when I go to one of these shows, you know, again, it's just row after row after row of indie people, self-publishers, small press. Right. You get a hint of it sometimes at the big show in Artist Alley, but even the people in Artist Alley tend to be more established. So I think you really have to go to a, an SBX or a MOCA is the one in New York or TCAF. 
Uh, they've also had them in Denver, Portland, Seattle. You know, it's it's a scene you you have to uh, to visit on your own. Oh, Mice in Boston is another one. I think Massachusetts Independent Comics Expo, maybe. Cool. Yeah. So they're they're all over, and I find them exciting because it reminds me a lot more of what I did at the beginning, which was it's all self-published. It is mostly or predominantly autobiographical stories or biographical. A lot of them are about causes. Um, I see a lot of stuff now, LGBTQ, the trans community, political activists who, uh, you know, are uh, on, on, on the, the left, the leftist side of the Democratic Party and the socialists. And they all have stories and they're not all necessarily polished and slick cartoonists that could get published in a national publication, but there's tremendous energy and feeling in it. And, you know, that's as valid as, as anything. I'd rather read those than some shallow, slick superhero comic myself. Do you read many comics these days? Huh. I haven't read a Marvel or DC comic in probably 15, 20 years. Uh, they just hold no interest to me. I like graphic novels. I like a lot of translated uh, material coming from Europe or Asia. Um, I just don't like, with the exception of maybe the spirit, you know, I, I don't like characters with masks and capes and powers. I did when I was a teenager, but they bore me now. And uh, I'm sure there's creative things being done. I don't mean to disparage any of it, but it doesn't speak to me at my age and my place in life. I'm looking for stories that are more real, not fantasy. Where do you find those stories? Well, uh, conventions. I, I, I go to several conventions a year. I always go shopping. Um, there are some uh, mail order companies that I get things from, a couple that I discovered on Instagram. Um, I'm trying to not remember. One is in Denver. I forgot the name offhand. Um, it's not Mile High, is it? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, he's, he's also... Uh, one of the largest uh, mail order places out there, but no, not for the kind I'm talking about. I'm sure it's, it's easy, you know, use the Google machine, type in yeah. independent comics and good idea. You know, they're definitely out there and, um, and, and a, and a good percentage of them are, are well worth pursuing. I also see some because my youngest daughter, Violet is a student at the center for cartoon studies in white river junction, Vermont. Wow. which is a school for cartoonists, but it emphasizes the kind I just described, um, stories that are more autobiographical and personal. They're not training you to draw X-Men. Right. They're drawing you, they're, they're teaching you to do the next mouse, you know. Is that where Stephen Bissett teaches? Yes. He retired, but until recently, yes. Now it's uh, Tilly Walden is on staff and uh, and uh, Jason Lutz, among others. And they've got some really good uh, instructors there. And, of course, James Sturm was the founder. So, uh, so through my daughter, I get to discover uh, a lot of talent, too. And uh, it's, it's a different world than, <clears throat> than what you'd find in an average comic shop. Yeah, and Mike, you can also go to denniskitchen.com, and there's a, there's some stuff there you can find. Well, that's going to be more backstock, not the <laughs> right. contemporary, not, yeah. but, but thanks for the plug. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I was, uh, no, when I was, when I was checking it out, I was, I, I thought it was pretty cool, the different things you had there with the, uh, some of the, I think you have some original art that's yep. connected to that, and then, and then, yep. uh, some of the other books and things. Um, so yeah, definitely anybody that wants to check out that stuff, definitely go to denniskitchen.com. 
Okay. Remember to spell it with one N on Dennis. I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> it's it's yeah. pretty cool. There's like he's well, thank you. a lot of stuff on there. Well, you mentioned original art. I I'm I'm happy to say um, I exclusively represent the estates of Will Eisner, Harvey Kurtzman, Al Cap, Howard Cruz, to name several. So if you want original art by any of them, by plus them, yeah. Some other people that we don't exclusively represent, right? And uh, and it's back stock of some of the underground comics we still have, or early graphic novels, buttons, postcards, hippie tchotchkes. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, Mike. That's <laughs> I'm uh, technologically challenged. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah. Uh, I, and you said uh, your new book is should be coming out in November? Um, it hasn't gone to press yet, but the publisher thinks it'll be out in fall. So I'm thinking September right. is optimistic. October, I hope. November at worst. Hey. If, uh, if anybody goes to TintoPress.com, they can order it if they miss the Kickstarter and uh, maybe Ted, the publisher will tell them when it's coming out before I know. Yeah. <laughs> with it, with the updates, that's yeah. tends to happen. Yeah. You know, I, I can't help but think that supply chain issues and, and paper issues have impacted uh, the small publishers more than most. Right. Yeah. Well, and, my, and Mike and I know, and well, a lot of people do too, and we shared it on here, like even just the, uh, especially if you don't have a big print run, um, but you're using a decent printer, they kind of push you down the down the queue. And are, when they're printing all of the, the uh, high school yearbooks and, and other things, um, which I think happened to both Mike and I, um, but it's, and, but a lot of other people too. And it's just, it's just because of the amount of their, their print you know, the print run and everything, but, uh, no question. Um, it's, uh, it's just the nature of big printers. So depending on what you're publishing, it's always nice to support the local small printers too. Right. Many yep. of whom are capable and even competitive. If you're doing a large print run, yeah, you probably want to go to China mm -hmm. or yep. some other place where labor is cheaper. But, but, um, I found that for some work, it makes sense to do it domestically and you'll get it a lot faster. You don't have to wait for that slow boat that takes six weeks. And then uh, sits off the coast of San Diego for six or, months. Or Long Beach or thereabouts. Yeah. Well, they also have too many holidays. They, they, they go on holiday so much over there. They I have just, their own new year. Can you believe it? I know <laughs> the arrogance. No, the, 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 uh, uh, but I, I I know a lot of people that have, that have done that, and there was like no other issues, only the fact that there were so many holidays in the in the time, and it's like and they have to take them, so um, they they have to close down and everything. So uh, yeah. yeah, that that can definitely. But I will say, and I'll throw this out since you uh, were talking about smaller printers, um, we actually have a great comic printer in Orlando. I'm in Florida. Right. Um, and, uh, although I did live in Wisconsin for four years, um, of course you did. I, I know, of course, um, the, uh, but called Kablam, uh, printing oh, and they do, right. they do a lot of, um, good uh, really good stuff in there yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. So definitely, definitely support your uh, local printers. And it is really cool too. Like I like what some of the, some of the people have been, uh, using some of which is a little hard to find but have been using some of the printers that still print on like the the newspaper paper right. yeah newsprints actually yeah surprisingly hard to, to yeah, acquire. yeah yeah but uh yeah but if you want to do it look different smell different definitely smells different <laughs> <laughs> right but uh yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll let you go now, so you can call back all the people who who have been <laughs> trying to get, get a hold of you. They're probably just going to sue you or something. So <laughs> get in line, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, this was fun reminiscing, guys. Um, yeah. Maybe we'll do it again sometime. I yeah. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.